what ride did you get in this morning? I uh, rode up to Reddish Knob and back mm-hmm. and figured I'd do like just a, a nice steady ice of power effort for like an hour and 10 minutes. Nice. Uh, yeah, just trying to like get that metabolic engine moving. And yeah, there's going to be a whole lot of like heavy fueling and steady diesel rolling. So that, that's what I like to do when I don't want to really wear myself out. I just want to like mm-hmm. put down some uh, kilojoules and just put the diesel up to good idle and empty the tank a bit and then uh, top it back off with some flow formulas recovery drink. You know, I got yeah, my yeah. little. Here we go. I got my little. Uh, what talking about. <laughs> yeah. Is that chocolate you got there? You, you're that? drinking chocolate mix? Is that chocolate mix? Oh, this is, oh yeah, it's just really. Uh, I think I like made it a little too thick, but I. I kind of like it like a chocolate smoothie, you know. It's mm. it's really tasty with some crushed ice. Okay, but you don't nice. mix it, like any berries or anything else in it, just straight flow. Mm. My chocolate's the jam. Okay, Good. that's what I was wondering because, like, I like the vanilla because it's like a nice basic platform that you can use to like add whatever flavoring you want. But chocolate and like berries and stuff just doesn't go too well. Mm, it could it could go with raspberry. It's kind of like the good uh, I have a chocolate. Okay. Yeah, like dark place. chocolate, dark raspberry. I, yeah. Adam, you do have a good point. I like the vanilla because the base is pretty mellow and it's not super sweet. So it does really go well with like some crushed raspberries or frozen blueberries. That's uh, yep. really good. Yeah. Good one, one of my favorite go-tos is just vanilla and bananas. You get like just this like super rich banana milkshake and it's just awesome. <laughs> Have you tried the Flow Formulas Margarita though? I, what? I haven't even tried the Flow Formulas Margarita. I've never even heard of that. I don't need. Oh come is on! That, is that a Jeremiah special, or do they yeah, offer that? Is, that is. You Are... put the crushed ice in the blender with uh, lemon lime, and then uh, yeah, you just put a little bit of agave on the rim of your cup, dip it upside down on the salt, add some Patron, some triple sec, and boom. <laughs> nice. that's what i'm talking about nice. it's really that's what, that's <laughs> what we need your, in the bonk bros kind of yeah. get your celebration it's, it's 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 good i'll make one for you at leadville dylan it'll it'll really hook you up for sbt Sweet. <laughs> okay so uh i'm for for the listeners we're talking about leadville today that's probably in the title so you probably already know um leadville and sbt are back-to-back I'm technically signed up for SBT, but I'm going to be honest. I'll make the call after I do Leadville. Uh, Leadville is the primary focus. <laughs> like you're going to you feel great after Leadville. I mean, I'm probably, <laughs> you know, when I, when I do stage racing, usually the second day is my worst day. I'll do okay on the first day. I do not so great on the second day. And then I get stronger as the stage race progresses. So... I don't know. Are you doing both? <laughs> if I can get in. Okay. I'll take yeah, Dylan's spot. Long short of it is like, uh, I tore my ACL in end of February, I guess it was beginning of March. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I was like, I don't even know what I'm doing this summer, but I was already registered for Leadville. So I could choose not to do it, but I definitely wasn't in the mindset of like, Oh, SBT the day after. Let's sign up for. <laughs> I don't know. It just didn't even seem humanly possible to to think about doing two back to back. But now I'm actually in a really good way. Um, form is good. Mentally, I'm like feeling like it's August, but it's also like you know I'm at a really good lightweight. I'm feeling mm-hmm. fit, feeling like I'm having a good time riding off road. No issues. Knee is pretty stable. I can lift weights in the gym, so pretty lucky. Sweet. So, did you yeah. need surgery, or were you able to rehab it on your own, like with um, PT yeah, and stuff? I mean, yeah, I mean it's a full ACL oh. separation. So, okay. Most doctors would recommend you get surgery for that. I'm of the mindset that if I can get in a season and then do the surgery, I definitely will do well for my sponsors. In that way, I can, you know stick with my commitments for the impossible route episodes that we've got. So far, so good. Uh, but I'm one hard foot down from tearing the MCL, tearing the meniscus, 
I'm really wrecking my knee pretty bad. So really need to be careful on it. So you will definitely see me going for the downhill KOM on power line. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Full gas. Um, sweet. So, so, so Dylan, so I'll, I'll give you this from last year. So I, I okay. crewed at Leadville, which obviously isn't nearly as hard as racing it, but it's pretty damn hard. Like, I don't know if you ever crewed for a race, but to be out there all day in the mm-hmm. sun and it's, you're cheering and stuff. I mean, it's pretty tough. Um, and then I hopped in the car and drove to Steamboat and then raced Steamboat the next day. And I thought that was pretty hard, like just to crew and then really go race hard. steamboat. Like it's a, it's a long transfer. It's like three plus yeah. hours in through the mountains. I was driving myself. So like, if you've got someone driving, you can nap or something. Maybe it's a little different, but it was a, it was a pretty grueling couple of days. So mm-hmm. I, I, if I were you, Dylan, I'd, I'd make the call ahead of time. Cause like JB said, like it's, Commit. it's going to be tough to make that call after Leadville. Commit. You're, Especially yeah, once you get one of those, uh, those flow margaritas in you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I, I, I agree decent. that if I agree that if I if uh, if the goal is to do both of them, deciding to do SBT after Leadville is not ideal. But what I'm telling, I guess what I'm saying is that if I don't SB, do SBT, I'm not really going to be that disappointed. I uh, I raced myself a little bit into the ground in the first half of the season, and I'm trying not to do that in the second half of the season here. Yeah. I, I definitely felt like it put a fine finish to my season when I did it. Mm-hmm. Like I was like when I, I also have done Leadville wreck, which is Correct. a really tough mm-hmm. double. And both times I was like, okay, I'm done. Like I didn't want to look at my bike. I was ready for, uh, yeah, swimming and sitting at the beach and just putting it up until, yeah, sure. For a yeah, have you done I, it both ways where you do Breck first and then Leadville and then vice versa, Leadville then Breck? Have you done it both? Uh, yeah, interestingly, my last good performance at Leadville was after winning Breck Epic. So I went okay. up pretty early, did a lot of intermittent hypoxic training, had a pretty good ramp. I uh, was up there about 10 days before the event. One Breck Epic, decidedly, really a good, strong race. I was like on it. And then the guys were like, Hey, can you do Leadville and support, you know, if we need a wheel or anything, um, cause with Topi Gurgaon, we would race as a squad, you know, as a real, uh, mm-hmm. team collective. And I was like, sure, you know, I'll ride to the base of Columbine and then I'll pull out and I'll hang out at the <laughs> aid station and drink some beer. And, you know, that was my plan, but I wasn't the top five and, if you're in the top five of the race, you don't drop out. So uh, <laughs> I did a blistering pace into the base of the climb, like pretty much just lit it up for uh, Alvin and Christian and then uh, kind of pulled it over and rode my pace. And I did stop at the aid station and, you know, got like uh, one of those hot dogs. They had like hot dogs anyway. Um, but then I got back going and then I hooked up with Alex Grant. And Alex and I used to race like a ton Um on CFR and Mona V. Cannondale. I was like, dang, you know, I can ride with Alex. This is going to be awesome. So I rode with Alex and, uh, you know, got him in the last climb. So yeah, nice. I was really surprised. I got fit. Yeah, I was really like, Phew. I was crippled though. <laughs> like I crossed the line. I was, I definitely balled up like into like a, like this potato bugs, you know, they just kind of curl up. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Bad. So we, we definitely wanted to we're, we definitely wanted to talk about Leadville in years past, and then we'll transition to talking about Leadville this year. But both Adam and I wanted to hear about the record breaking year that Albin mm. went uh, sub six, and you were right behind him, and you were obviously part of that team that helped him do that. Mm. Um, people are talking about how this could potentially be a record breaking year. And being that you were part of that team, I know how strong Albin was back then. I mean, he's still strong, but I, I, wh- what are your thoughts on that? And and what exactly did you guys have to do in order to set that record? I'd love to see someone break that record. I'd love to see someone getting close to breaking that record. Uh, I don't know if you looked closely at the winning times for the last several years. Obviously, there was a COVID year there, but uh, what was Keegan's time last year? I, I don't know if that was like my head, six fifteen or so, six twelve, I think maybe. Yeah, that sounds 
very plausible. Um, and that's scorching. Like he absolutely ripped the last 90 minutes of the race. Fastest time mm -hmm. ever. A um, few seconds ahead of Albin split for that last segment. And I've done a bit of analysis of it because, you know, I'm always, um, I might not be to the form right now to tangle with the record, but I do like analyzing the, uh, the race. I do like looking at the, the performance output needed, uh, what factors really played into uh, that performance. And then also kind of looking at um, a bit of the apples and oranges that are the different years. Uh, and so at the end of the day, it's a bike race. Um, and each, each year is a little different formula from the standpoint of the competition, the form in which they come into the race, as well as the dynamics that play out on the road or on the trail. Um, and you kind of hear that in road racing, like, well, hey, you know, no one wanted to chase the guy who was way down on GC that attacked early, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, the same kind of dynamics take place in a race like Leadville. If someone you know is not going to hold till the end takes off at the feed zone or whatever, you're just like, you know, I'm just going to stay with the, the fast guys. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the exception was obviously 2015. Uh, I remember sitting in Lago de Garda in Italy, right at the end of Trans Out. We were having pizza. It was an awesome finish to a really phenomenal race. And I came to, you know, talking about Leadville. <clears throat> and I said, hey, we should work as a team and try to break the record. Like, not just go and ride a negative race. We should just set up the time splits. You know, I work for you guys. And Christian, Albin, like, you know, you get the power line. If we can be 10 minutes up on record pace by that time period, then, you know, you can definitely do it. Uh, so we basically had, I had two Garmin's on. I actually had uh, one with a watch. My Garmin watch I actually had on, I have a 920 XT. And I had the split pacer, you know, where you have average miles per hour. Um, but then also had the time splits on the top tube. Each one of us had the time splits on the top tube. Um, and we had very good. The reason that I thought it would be a very good year to go for the record was because world championships was at altitude. So I'm trying to remember, I think it was in Livigno. Um, so Livigno, or maybe it was like Celeronda. Yeah, I think it was mm -hmm. Celeronda. Uh, area of Italy. So Northern Italy, high, high elevation race started at 7,000, went up to like 8,900. Um, so everyone that was vying for the race went to altitude early. Christian, Albin, Christoph Sauser, uh, the guy from Denmark that showed up at the race, they had all had three weeks at altitude, like after Transalp, which is already a good amount of altitude. Then they came down, did a race at sea level. Then they went up. And we raced the three-day Breck Epic the same week mm. as Leadville. And I'm still unable to wrap my head around this because I'm looking at the, the 2015, the week before the race, just last night. And I'm like, holy shit. I mean, we, like, we're setting Strava KOMs, like, all throughout Breckenridge racing the three-day Breck Epic. Like, full gas over Wheeler Pass. Mm -hmm. uh yeah and, and over uh mount Guyo, the colorado mountain the uh, colorado uh trail stage and and the pennsylvania gulch stage i mean just full gas i mean i was like like had a noose around my neck breathing so hard uh yeah so i don't even know how two days later you know we recovered I think it was two or three days later. I think it was three days later we did Leadville um, and broke the record. Uh, but I, I think it was that we were all very fit, all very conditioned for altitude. And we had a plan and we stuck to the plan. And even though Christoph Sauser was refusing to pull through for most of the six hours, we <laughs> still stuck with the plan. And it was kind of dangerous having someone as decorated as Christoph Salazar, five-time winner of Cape Epic, multi-time world champion, what, 10 World Cup wins? I mean, we had somebody like that on Specialized sitting on the back of our train. And I'm mm -hmm. just like, geez, fuck, this is going to be bad if he beats us. But I had faith in 
and Christian and Albin's uh, performance. The other thing is we got to Powerline after you know knocking minutes and minutes and minutes off the split times. Um, and yeah, yeah, Christian took off. I mean, just scorched it up power line. Still the fastest KOM time up power line. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think his Red Bull probably worn out a little, wore out a little bit, you know, by the time he got the sugar loaf because Alvin was coming for him hard. Um, Christoph Souser and myself got pretty close to Alvin, but once we got within like 40 seconds, I stopped pulling and really tried to put the brakes on the chase, which really pissed off Souser. Um, and then we got to the next climb and I started to attack and then sit on, attack, sit on, attack, sit on. After four or five times of doing that, I slowed it down pretty good. Um, got it to be negative for a little bit. Uh, but that allowed, you know, Alvin to get up to Christian and Christian cramped in the last 200 meters Mm. in the lead. Mm -hmm. And Alvin sprinted, Christian just he was cramped so bad his right leg unclipped and he almost like <sighs> racked his nuts on the top too. That's how to the limit he was. And he lost the win by like 20 feet. Like, I mean, it was, he had a two minute lead coming into the last climb on the railroad tracks. Yeah. Like that was, that was the speed difference. Um, so it's a really interesting race. It's one of which you can blow up in very easily. Uh, the pacing, um, yeah, in that case, it was all or nothing. I mean, it was like, well, we're just going to ride, you know, this this this, uh, this plan, and and you know, if we if we keep to this plan, we'll keep on chewing minute minutes 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 out of the out of the uh, fastest known time, and it worked. And, sure. Uh, I mean, not only that, but the four of us, myself, Christoph Sauser. I mean, the top four that day put down the top four fastest time. Alvin Licata has the fifth fastest time. Like, yeah, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's really wild that that record still stands. You look at the nutrition. Um, you look at the optimization of performance uh, parts, tires, bikes, gear. I mean, aero shoe covers. Uh, you know, some of the riders are using exogenous ketones. There's all kinds of stuff available now that wasn't in 2015. Will we see a record? I would bet not. I really mm-hmm. doubt it. Uh, despite the fact that Keegan is um, as good of a climber as Alvin or Christian was at their peak. Um, and I think the reason is because there's going to be negative racing. No one wants anybody else to get away on Columbine. And, you know, once they catch up, why are they going to pull through? Like, I remember, like, after I caught up, Christoph Salzer and I got gapped just a little bit at the very top. And, I mean, Salzer just went apeshit down the mountain chasing to get back on to Christian and Albin. And, uh, yeah, it was risky. It was super sketchy. And we caught back on. I grabbed the bottle, drank from the bottle, got right back to the front and started pulling again. And it was that mm-hmm. I was just trying to get the power line and then, you know, yeah. just limp in. Uh, but I was able to, I don't know. I just had, I, I had like one pace and it was a good pace. And um, yeah, it was definitely one of my better races. So it was pretty cool. I've also had some pretty rough races at Leadville. It's, <laughs> it's extremely challenging if you're not acclimating for it. And truth be told, my expectations for this race Pretty minimal, you know. I'm gonna have fun, and mm-hmm. I'm gonna go, you it's know, see, see what my body has, uh, you know, to, to put out that day, and and see if I can just latch on to the front group and have some fun and ride with my friends. And uh, haven't done any al- altitude acclimation, uh, so we'll see what happens. It's probably gonna hurt a lot. Yeah, yeah, I agree. <laughs> so. I think with the the Lifetime Grand Prix, with Leadville being part of the Lifetime Grand Prix this year, it may be the deepest uh, amount of talent that Leadville has ever seen. I just Definitely. don't know if the, I don't know if the top five, first of all, there's not going to be teams working together like there was with Topi Kurgan. And second of all, I don't know if, um, 
it, it seems like Keegan is probably right up there with Albin and Christian in terms of climbing. But, um, you know, I, I don't know if the, I don't know if the top five at Leadville this year matches the top five of Leadville that year. Yeah. We'll just have to see. Um, I, I think it's maybe someone needs to put up some money to see that record <laughs> broken. Mm -hmm. Like I'd love to see life. Sure. And say, all right, anybody that breeds the record 10 grand, like just throw that out there as a bonus. I'd sure. do it if I had an extra 10 grand. I mean, most I can put, I'll put up a thousand bucks. I like to see anybody break it. So we can get, uh, we, we can get into this year's race. And I think we should start with uh, Keegan put up a Instagram story of his hardtail with drop bars on it. And he tagged. Oh, is that his Led bike? I thought it was his friend's bike or something. Was it his friend's bike? I could be completely wrong about this. So, so he tagged, he tagged, he tagged Leadville and he said, you know, uh, um, and I, and I thought that it was his bike and his, it was basically his hardtail mountain bike, you know, set up for mountain bike racing. Only difference is it had drop bars, um, as if that was the bike that he was going to race at Led Leadville. And now you sent me a text earlier this week and, and you're, you're like, <laughs> I don't, I don't think any of your competition is listening to this. No, definitely not. They give because, me because I, I, I discuss arrow bars a lot on this podcast and I actually don't want the top guys. I don't want any of them to run arrow bars. I want to be the only one. <laughs> so, They're fast. um, so, uh, but y you sent me a text earlier this week saying, do you think that a gravel bike will be faster at Leadville? I told you my opinion. I don't think it's faster. Um, but what do you think? So I want to get your opinion on the gravel bike at Leadville for sure. What do you think of Keegan's idea? Potentially, uh, we, we don't know this for sure of doing just drop bars on a mountain bike hardtail. Yeah, I'm looking for it. I don't see. The well, it's gone now. It was on his story a couple days ago. Oh, okay. It was some stealth business there. Yeah. Um, yeah. The reason I sent that was because I thought it would be something different and fun to try. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, like I've done it a bunch of times. Uh, I think it's a, a cool, it's a cool race. You know, it's kind of like Ironman is for a lot of amateur athletes. It's, it's like a, a big thing to look forward to. Um, mm -hmm. But as far as, you know, being a competitive mountain bike racer for so long, I've really kind of thought, man, I, you know, miss doing some more single track. Um, but mm -hmm. if you look at it as a gravel race, it's kind of like a really awesome course for a gravel race, right? It's like, sure. man, it's pretty freaking cool course if you put it in those terms. Um, so I got to thinking, I was like, well, you know, the bikes have come a long way. The tires are getting better and better. The bikes are lighter. Like my Grizzle has a really wide gear range. And I mean, I can get down on that bike like and put a good good amount of speed on the flats on it. Like I just really mm -hmm. comfortable on it. And yeah, I mean, you'd lose a couple minutes on the two big downhills, mm -hmm. but then, you know, if you were, if you were in the front, it wouldn't be so bad. Like, mm -hmm. cause then the group would collect and then they'd catch you. I don't know. I think with one of those explore forks or something, or one of the Fox gravel forks, like mm -hmm. it might be the faster bike. I don't know. I don't know. So <laughs> yeah, so I I actually proposed this to Lifetime and Steamboat last year when they, or I guess it was like three years ago when they when they like per, first put out that they were going to do that the, the uh, lead boat challenge or whatever. I said, why don't you make it a one bike race? Whatever I bike you it. do Leadville on, you've got to do Steamboat on, dude. I think I it'd be awesome. It. I think I think companies would get behind it. You'd get to see some really sweet you know, like gravel bike hybrid type options. Maybe some people would just go for the mountain bike and, you know, do better in one or, you know, go for the gravel yeah. bike and do better in steamboat or whatever. But I think it would make it really interesting. Um, and, and it yeah, I mean, I, 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 I see what you're saying though. Like, so I, I think Dylan, I talked to you about this before, but uh, last year when I was crewing, I, I rode from, uh, from the Twin Lakes Dam aid station back to the start basically. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. on my gravel bike, I did like those 40 miles or whatever. 
Um, cause I only had my gravel bike with me cause I was only racing steamboat. Uh, and it was like, it was the perfect bike for pretty much everything except sugarloaf descent for yeah. those 40 miles. Now yeah, I didn't do lots. Columbine up or down. So, hmm. you know, you're missing out on some key 20 miles there, what size um, but tire? it was, it was awesome. What size tires did you run? Uh, I was just on forties, yeah. uh, the Vittoria Terreno dry, uh, standard dry tires. Um, you know, so nothing, nothing too big. I didn't have inserts. I had pretty deep, uh, carbon wheels on it. Um, and I only had like a 46 by 10, 42 gearing. Mm -hmm. So my smallest gear was a 46, 42 and I rode all of power line just fine. Um, granted it was, you know, less than half the race into it than, than you'd normally be. But, um, it was like the whole time I was thinking like, wow, you could totally do this race on a gravel bike. Uh, there would be a few, you know, there'd be probably half an hour total of descending that you'd be kind of kicking yourself for doing that. But the other six or five and a half hours, like, I think, I think you could do pretty well on it. Mm -hmm. Especially with the rain, packing everything down. It's not like loose and, and sketchy. And I mean, it was, yeah, and it was super loose last year. It was really dry last year too. Well, the so, Grizzle, yeah, get some the grizzle dirt. fits 50 C. So like during some of the impossible routes, we'll run like this 2.0 tire. So mm -hmm. it fits some pretty decent tires. Like I ran a 2.0 when we broke the record at, at Leadville. Like that was, we ran Continental Race Kings 2.0 front and rear. Mm -hmm. I cut the bars down. Like I'm not telling you all my secrets, but yeah, I definitely <laughs> went old school with a bar width and it was awesome. Like, there was a lot of a lot of little details that added up. Uh, were you guys on hardtails or, or we were on the for Exceed that? prototype hardtails? Uh, so we okay. had the Exceed prototype hardtails with the SRAM rims, like when they were making wheels. We had prototype Continental Race King tires. Um, the rear we had like uh, I had done quite a bit of work on conditioning the tires. Um, <laughs> so the tires actually roll faster, like the production tires, once they're broken in, is one of the things I was really noticing. Uh, so what I did is actually, I got a new set of tires and I rode them on the rollers, um, until they were broken in. So I did like two half an hour sessions where I just rode them at like, I don't know, like 10 PSI mm. and just <laughs> really got the side wall nice and, and soft. And then I clipped the rear tire down quite a bit. I really, um. I didn't like the follow tread tire that Continental had. They had one that was like sort of a snake belly type of tread. Um, mm -hmm. But what I did was um, I clipped like the knobs on the top of the tire. So the tire kept a pretty round shape, but all the tire knobs on the back tire I clipped down um, about to half. So, <laughs> yeah, it was a very, very fast setup. Yeah, and like, if... if any anybody who's been on that um bicycle tire rolling resistance.com website the the conti race king in its stock form is one of the fastest mountain bike tires that you can get i think the only one so that they've got some on there that aren't really mountain bike tires like the schwalbe big apple or something which yeah. is basically just a giant road tire yeah. Sure. <laughs> I think the only actual mountain bike tire that's faster than the Conti Race King is the uh, Schwalbe Thunderbird in like the light skin version, which if you run that, you're basically asking to get a flat. <laughs> you're, 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 yes, you're totally begging for a flat. Um, that's mm -hmm. why I ran a protection tire. Uh, we had the fastest tires like mm -hmm. you could possibly get. And... Yeah, I mean, we didn't do, I don't think we did any special like chain wax. Um, you know, Todd was doing a chain wax, but mm -hmm. he flatted that day. And once he flatted, he, there was no catching up. Like there was, sure. it was the train had left the station as we were rotating through. And, you know, it was, it was a good group we had going. Um, of course, it's a little bit different now, too. So that's that's worth noting. So they had some private property issue, I think, around the south end of Twin Lakes. So I think they have to do like this dog leg, mm -hmm. which added the half a mile or something like that. And then they also didn't want to have the double traffic on the single track climbing mm -hmm. back. Yeah. So they went yep. like, through a round, which I approve of. I think it's a great 
uh, change in general. Um, so now instead of like going all the way to the Columbine mine, they turn around at the top of the climb. Um, I certainly don't mind having a little less climbing or a little less riding <laughs> up there, 13,600 feet or whatever it is. Uh, you kind of go up and then you turn right back down and get the hell out of there. Yeah. Um, I always thought that long expanse up there, you're just completely tripping. Like, I mean, full on seeing stars and just trying mm-hmm. to breathe and kind of a little like panicky, you know, you're like <laughs> just knowing you're right. not getting enough oxygen to your brain and your muscles. It's just a freaky feeling. Uh, so yeah, I don't mind that, that change. I think it's a good change. And you know, I think there's also that single track that is like just north of Twin Lakes also has a ride around now. So instead of going up mm-hmm. the single track, it's going up a dirt road. So whether or not yeah. those things are faster, slower, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think it's um, kind of maybe a touch less climbing, but then also a touch longer. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I think it's pretty pretty darn close. What do you think, yeah. Dylan? Well, I, I never saw the old course. This is my literally my first time doing Leadville. So, but yeah, I mean, the course seems super fast. I mean, I, I, the first time I rode the course, I was staying strictly zone two. Like I didn't go above zone two one time and I was on pace for an eight hour finish. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's a, for a hundred mile mountain bike course. It's, it's, it's super fast. Um, when, when we were talking about, about what bike is the fastest, I'm sure you probably agree with this, but having ridden the whole course at this point multiple times, because I've been up here for a month, I, I'm I'm like 90% sure that it's a hardtail. And as far as handlebar setup goes, flat bars with arrow bars attached to them. Um, I think if you do drop bars, you're going to lose too much on the descents. If you keep the flat bars, you're going to be fine on the descents. And then arrow bars where you need to be aerodynamic are actually more aero than being in the drops in a drop bar. So there are some sections where it's too bumpy to use the aero bars where a drop bar has the advantage. I just don't think there are enough of those sections to make up for what you're going to lose on the descent or for what you're going to gain on the parts where you can actually use the aero bars and be more aerodynamic than a drop bar. I got a nerdy question for you, and you probably know the answer because you're a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> but does Best Bike Split allow you to change modalities throughout your split um, mm. pace strategy? Uh, I don't know. I'd have to That'd see. That'd be the way to do it. The yeah. way to do it would be so. One of the things that I was looking at when I was testing the aerodynamics and setup of the aero bars. Uh, tire configurations, you know, I was kind of doing some field testing. Um, so did you guys run aero bars in 2015? I ran aero bars. Um, you did. Okay. I was going to be at the pointy end of the group on the faster section. So I rode all yep. the hills okay. and flats. So if it was false flat downhill, I would just say, get out of my way guys and just mm-hmm. go to the front. Um, and I didn't have to ride that hard. It was just a very good, you know, wind breaking position. Um, yep. The, the thing about the analyzing aerodynamics for a mountain bike, which is very, very, uh, good to point out is that most people have it wrong. So when you look at the specialized wind tunnel series, mm-hmm. arrows, everything or whatever, I mean, that's cool and all, but, um, you're not going to hold your handlebars like this <laughs> and I'm, I'm holding my hand next to the stem for those who are listening. That position was said to be the fastest. Anyone who has tried to <laughs> their entire body weight with their triceps while leaning forward with their chin next to their hands will realize it's a very uncomfortable position after about two minutes. And in three mm-hmm. minutes and four minutes, you can't even hold it. It's completely unfeasible. That's like, okay, you want to tuck and get quick for a few minutes, but that's not a sustainable long duration pace. Um, so while that looks good on paper, it's absolutely junk um, yeah. for long durations. Now, you know, hands on the foreground actually is pretty good because you can ride there all day. Uh, it's very comfortable um, if your hands can withstand it. 
And then the arrow bars, way superior because you can actually get a break from all the upper body, shoulder, and hand gripping that normally takes place. It's actually a pretty comfortable position. I, I tell myself that I'm just like chilling, taking a nap when I'm in the arrow bars. You know, you can crank, mm -hmm. you can just kind of like let your upper body relax. Um, you know, it's a pretty efficient position. So, uh, yeah, I agree with you, Dylan, on, on that aspect. Um, the other thing, too, when you're looking at aerodynamics and if I get a chance to go to the wind tunnel one day, which I would love to do, um, A2 wind tunnel, I considered going there a couple times. I was that close to going. But then I was like, really? This is stupid. <laughs> but actually, it's kind of fun. It's kind of cool. Um, yeah. You know, when you look at the effect of being fast in your normal descending position, just, just imagine like you're descending, you know, your legs extended, elbows out. Skin suit, for example, a very fast skin suit is going to make a whopping difference mm -hmm. in that position. Um, yep. It is really, it's really uh, very evident. And aero helmet, we did not have aero helmets, by the way. We taped the top of our helmets. Um, mm -hmm. So we had the lightest helmet in the world from Lamar. We taped the top of it. The taping was actually good because if you did get to overheating or something, you could rip it off. Um, but mm -hmm. all the coast downs that I did with the tape was really pretty damn fast. It was, it was pretty decent. Uh, mm -hmm. So... Yeah, I mean, there was a bunch of little things. That's just sort of scratching the surface. Um, but really, like, you know, when you look at the, um, yeah, the, the total sum, you kind of have to, like, break it down into blocks. And so if you mm -hmm. really wanted to look at it, you'd say, all right, well, this section, you're just descending normal position. So you should also optimize your normal descending position. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway. Now, we... Uh... After Unbound um, on this podcast, we had a long discussion. We, we were talking about Unbound in general, but uh, after we got we got past the, you know, breaking down what happened during the race of Unbound, we had a long discussion about aero bars and the spirit of gravel, uh, specifically with how it relates to aero bars. You were an aero bar OG. In fact, I would dare to say that you were the inspiration for me being such an aero bar nerd. Uh, that I am right. today, and now you flipped your tune on aero bars. Um, so uh, can can you tell us why you've done that? Well, I think it just comes down to the fact that for me, I like the dynamics of traditional racing and mm -hmm. the tactics that come along with it, um, and I feel like the the aero bars. I don't know. It's a love hate relationship. I'm not going to lie. Cause I mean, I've, mm -hmm. I've got some course records with aero bars and you know, yeah. they're fast. I mean, there's no two ways about it. Uh, but I also have a feeling that I like to have a fair race across the board. And I also like the dynamics of pack racing. And I think you get a little bit more of a rich dynamic with mm -hmm. traditional drop bars, for example, in a gravel race where you have a breakaway, the breakaway, if they work together really well, they might, they might stick it. They might stick it, but mm -hmm. you have someone with arrow bars like yourself, who's really damn slick. You, you know, give that guy a few seconds and they're right up there, uh, you know, able to close down what would take an entire group to normally close down. So it, it's going to increase the, the speed of the racing. And then I think it also kind of changes the dynamic a little bit. Sure. I don't know. I mean, I, I think the less I care, the more I want to just be, <laughs> you know, just riding. Sure. Maybe, maybe I'll adopt the same mentality by the time I'm your age, but I, I'll, so I, I, I get that, you know, it's, it's kind of cool to have an even playing field, but I will say that, one thing that I love to see in bike racing, most of the time in bike racing, the strongest person wins. But every once in a while in bike racing, you see somebody who is not the strongest person. They're the smartest person. Um, I mean, an example is like Mohoric when he ran a dropper post at Milan San Remo this year. 
uh, when various hour records were broken using various positions that were, you know, later deemed to be illegal by the UCI, uh, like Greg LeMond running arrow bars when he won the Tour de France. These people weren't stronger than their competition. They outsmarted their competition. And when that happens, I, that, I, 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 there's a big smile on my face anytime that happens. Um, so, I mean... Yeah. I get it. The yeah. is, is super cool. Right. And just thinking outside the box. I love to see people think outside the box. And then the result is that they win a bike race because of that. Like they, they didn't necessarily put out the most Watts that day, but they were smarter than everyone else. Yeah. I agree. I agree. It's, it's pretty fun. Well, I guess the, the debate is open still. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I, I, yeah, it's going to it's going to be open until like race directors come together and just start banning aero bars pretty much. I mean, as long as they're allowed, you know, and they're and they're legal. Yeah. Uh, I think I think there's always going to be a debate. Well, Adam, what do you think? Yeah, I I I agree with Dylan. Um, you know, and kind of like you JB. I mean, I I love to see that's what that's what's so cool about a race like Leadville. You know, for so many people, this is their big A race that they think about all year, they prep all year. They buy so many different you know, odds and ends mountain bike parts for their bike that they normally wouldn't run. Like I'm running aero bars this year. I've never used aero bars. I've never even considered aero bars on my mountain bike, but talking with Dylan so much here and, you know, kind of seeing his hopefully, side of it. It's hopefully like, you've if, gotten some practice all... in them. Yes. Yeah. No, I've got like, I've got like three weeks, three weeks of gravel riding in them. So cool. feeling cool. pretty good with them, but you know, it's like, Sure. If, if it, if it can save me some time, why, you know, why wouldn't you, as long as it's legal, you know, we're not talking about doping or anything, right. We're, we're talking about staying within the rules and if it's going to be beneficial, you know, whether it's like you JB talking about how you can take a nap, but still put out 330 Watts because you're just like letting your upper body go limp and, and you feel good in that position. Um, you know, or if it's just cause it's faster cause it's more arrow, you know, whatever it is, if it's going to mm -hmm. get you to that finish line faster, and it's legal. Uh, I'm all for it. I think I think that's totally fun. Um, but I also would, if, if they banned aero bars from all off-road races, I wouldn't be like out there picketing, like you know, in defense of aero <laughs> bars. Like I would, definitely. I would think that's fine. Like you know, it's it's like yeah, Dylan probably would be out there. But um, you know, I, I understand both sides of it too. And um, you know, you saw both 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 ends of the spectrum at a race like Unbound this year. You saw the lead group that was five or six that were coming to the line all together. Half of them had aero bars. One of them had those little, you know, dinky half aero bars, and a couple of the guys didn't have aero bars. You know, so you kind of see both, you know, both ends still in the mix. Um, you know, so it's not to say necessarily that one has to be faster than the other. Mm -hmm. You can certainly go fast either way, but it is fun to just see so much different uh, kind of innovation and thought process go into it. And so, mm -hmm. so anyway, so speaking of unbound, actually, this is the point where I was going to bring up. So, you know, Dylan, going back to the the sub six hour. Uh, kind of, or I guess it's 558.25 is the actual record for Leadville. Um, you know, we all knew that the Lifetime Grand Prix was going to elevate the the level of, you know, talent and performance at some of these races this year. Mm -hmm. But I think Unbound was a pretty big surprise for a lot of people. You know, I, mm -hmm. I think you would have expected maybe, you know, a, a record to be broken there, but probably not by more than half an hour. Sure. Uh, so for, for those leaders, you know, five leaders to come together and, and, and break the record by over 30 minutes. I think that says a lot for what could happen at Leadville this year. You know, I think a race like that is similar to a race like Leadville where it, it comes down to a race of attrition. So if you've got guys in the front that are motivated and they're working together because they want to dwindle that group down as, as small as possible, I, I think we might see some pretty pretty fast times. Now the, awesome. the caveat is un, unlike Unbound, where you're at sea level, where you can you can rebound if you do kind of burn some matches early on. If you do that at Leadville and you're not you're not prepared for it, then that's where we might see some unraveling taking place. Mm -hmm. So so I think that will throw you know a potential wrench in it. But I I think I think we're going to see at least to the top of Columbine some some pretty fast record-breaking times this year. And what happens after that, uh, maybe that's up for debate still. But um, I just think the level of competition, you know, not that when you guys raced in 2015, I mean, obviously you, your squad plus, you know, Souser, you, I mean, you guys had pretty high level of competition there. But I think the first two hours of having a group of probably 30 plus that are going to still be together, it's going to... Yeah. 
yeah, I mean, you're going to see some super fast speeds going on there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I so at Unbound, uh, Jeremiah and I, we talked a lot about my pacing strategy before the race. And I think most people at this point know about my pacing strategy if they listen to this podcast. I talked about it on this podcast, made a whole video about it, about how I basically ignored the front group at Unbound, got some guys to do this with me so I wouldn't be alone, and I basically rode the race as if it was a team time trial. Um, it, I mean, it worked out okay. Uh, I, I keep, I keep scratching my head as to whether I would have done better had I gone with the typical strategy, which is just stay with the front group until you pop. Um, I could have easily stayed with the front group until you know, mile 130 and then been completely toasted and then, and then finish worse, or I could have finished better. Who knows? Um, uh, ended up just barely breaking 10 hours. And I think I was 25th place. So Jeremiah, you were a little bit skeptical about that idea. I, I have a, I have a gut feeling that that, that strategy might work better at Leadville since Leadville is a mountain bike race. They're still drafting at Leadville, but it's it's less so than at Unbound. What are what are your thoughts with that? It's also at altitude, so you could potentially blow up even more catastrophically at Leadville. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, with the road aspect for Unbound, is it's a very tricky strategy. That strategy can work, but you have to have a lot of riders who are world class mm-hmm. around with you. Um and that's where I was like, well, okay, you've got some great riders, some strong riders to work with you, but can they help in the last five hours? And mm-hmm. that's where you were kind of by yourself, you know, and you rode a uh, phenomenal race. It was really strong. But um you know this the your total expenditure starts to become a factor and what I mean by this is even, you know, your, your nutrition is very optimized. With flow formulas, you're able to get in close to 100 grams of carbs per hour. But mm-hmm. still, you know, at peak output, I mean, you can burn 1,200 kilojoules per hour. I mean, you can burn way more than you're sucking in, even at your best effort. Um, and so you have this sort of, a, you know, bit of a conundrum there, too. And, yeah, I mean, you can't just, you know, run that diesel um, to death and then still try to, perform well in the finale of the race. So that's where burning a match or two to make the back of a big group really helps. Um, You can play the tactics. You can save a lot of energy and sit on and let some other people share the load. Uh, I think some combination of that strategy works really well. And, you know, for bigger races, I will very often sag climb like, Mm -hmm. You know, and, and riders will come by me and I'm like, well, if you want to do 480 watts, then go for it, bro. <laughs> you should do yeah. that <laughs> all you want, but it's not going to last. It's not going to work very long. However, you know, if you can latch on to the back of that group and then migrate way, way back to the front, do that a few times. You know, these riders, they kind of fall apart and become un- unglued um, when it comes to the last big climb. And, and really, like, when I look at my previous experiences at Leadville, it is not Columbine, it's Powerline. Powerline mm-hmm. is the race. So, you know, you look at, uh, you know, I had a good race with um, Todd Wells, Joe Dombrowski, myself, uh, came into Powerline, and, yeah, it was just who was still able to smash a pretty good pace. Uh, And it's really tough. It's a lot tougher than you think. Um, And I think that's partly because at altitude, you have a metabolic shift or preference for carbohydrates. And, you know, that is part of the magic of why 104 mile race seems way harder, way Mm -hmm. harder than a sea level 100 miler. Um, It's because it's like if someone said, hey, you have uh, you can only bring three bottles with you to race a hundred miles. And how would you feel in the last three hours? You feel like mm-hmm. your, you know, legs are completely empty and you know, you're, you're bonked out of your brain. And that's how a lot of people feel. Um, 
So, you know, one of the things to note is, is before we did the record attempt, I did a lot of fasted training. I mean, mm -hmm. I did some really nasty, nasty workouts. Um, yeah. So I would just go out and just smash it with no breakfast. I mean, just as gnarly, man. I, I, for any listeners out there that just heard that it's too late. So, so please, do please don't do implement that. that this week. <laughs> do not do that ever. Doesn't work. Um, well, there's, there's, there's times to do it and times not to do it. I would say that it is a very, uh, seldom, um, seldom occurrence. Um, but I definitely, I look back at the training because I really still trying to wrap my head around it. Cause it was quite a day. Uh, it was one of the few days where, former world champion came up and said, damn, you rode your ass off. I've never seen you ride like that. Um, Salazar came up to me and uh, that was a compliment I won't soon forget. Mm -hmm. uh, he did meet, beat me at the sprint, but uh, I drove the pace the entire last eight or 10 miles by myself on the front um, because I wanted to go sub six. Took a little bit of a wrong turn of like someone's driveway, came back down the driveway. <laughs> So that's like the 30 seconds, you know, I, I kind of count that as, as pretty much, uh, since I did the teamwork thing, uh, counted as a six hour, six hours and 38 seconds or something. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, it, it's really, um, it's really interesting having the metabolic flexibility, I think is pretty important. Uh, if you can save some glycogen that really helps. And so that endurance training that diesel, you know, really training that diesel, um, I think for that event was, was pretty effective and you don't spend a lot of time pushing high power. I mean, I had, I am like almost tie for the old KLM on, on Columbine one second behind Christian Heineck. And I think I did 315 Watts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. It'll, it'll, uh, it'll definitely be interesting this year. Um, yeah. Like I said, I think, I think, like I said earlier, I think deeper talent, but I don't, I don't know if the, if the very pointy end of the pointy, pointy end of the race, uh, I don't know if they'll be, I, I think probably the biggest thing is that, is that they're not going to be working together. None of, none of these guys are going to be working together. They're going to be trying to actively sabotage each other. So which yeah, might, yeah. Which, which might work against getting a super fast time. It might work toward you riding your pace, though, because, sure. you know, that'll have them right within re reach. And I think when you look at, like, how the pack dynamics work, um, you know, I always like to try to think of the chess game. Mm -hmm. And you ever hear the saying, uh, the enemy of your enemy is your friend? Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... You have to look at the likely scenarios when you're evaluating tactics. And throughout my career, I went from tactical dumbass to getting my <laughs> ass handed to me by really good, smart riders early on. Um, you know, it was like, okay, after Gunner beat me like five times and I was like stronger than him and he sat on my wheel to the, anyway, you get it. You know, after so <laughs> uh -huh. many repetitions yep. of frustrating ass kickings. I'm like, all right, I'm okay. I'm going to start picking this up. I'm going to start learning a little bit more about it and, and start just putting my brain to work. Um, yeah. If you look at the tactics, it's going to be interesting. A lot of these people are racing on Sunday. They know that if they waste a lot of energy riding off the front by themselves or smashing it only to get caught 10 miles later. Yeah. They, they know better. They know that every bit of energy they save today, they can mm -hmm. use at SBT Gravel. Hey, you know, if I was uh, Alex Howes, I'd be just tailgunning, eating and drinking, mm -hmm. and then see what happens on Powerline. Hell, I mean, if I was any of the guys who are really seriously considering doing well on Sunday, that's all I'd do. I would just be yeah. a non-factor, lowest denominator in the group, Staying out of trouble, sticking in the draft, eating, drinking, eating, drinking, 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 and saving the matches, keeping the tinder dry. It's going to blow up on power line anyway. It's mm -hmm. going to freaking explode. Even if you, no matter what your intentions are coming into it, 
you might think you're going to attack. Half the times I've thought that, I get there and I go, here's the anchor. Boom, just drop it. <laughs> and go backwards. Right. So I just am not going to go with any expectations and sure. just going to see what, what's, uh, you know, what we can do and have fun. Um, but for the riders that are, you know, serious contenders, you know, they're going to, yeah. And you might get someone animated. I hope there's someone that just like launches it, you know, and just like, I, I, I mean, there always is, right. <laughs> there's always somebody who thinks they can go from 10 mile, you know, 10 miles into the race. They're just going to go for it. Yeah. Did Alex Wilde take off last year? Well, I wasn't there, so I don't know, but yeah, I was trying to look, I was looking at Strava and, and, it, and it looked like Alex was up front on Columbine, but anyway, mm. I didn't really look back at the, the whole play by play, but yeah. yeah I think, uh, I think last year it was, um, it was Lachlan, Howie and Keegan that all came into Columbine together. Yeah, it did. So it I did blow I up. I don't on, think Alex Wild. It did blow up on power line just as, just as, uh, you're suggesting it does every year. Yeah. 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 Well, it's like yeah 20... came, came down to those three at power line too. Yeah. Yeah. It's I, usually the cramp. I think the I think the tactic that I'm going to go for this time is probably a hybrid of the unbound tactic and the tactic that most people usually do, which is just stay on the front group until you pop. Um, I'm going to be I'm going to be taking a look at my power constantly. If and and I've been riding up here at altitude, so I've got a I've got an idea of what's sustainable and what's not sustainable. Like if we hit that first climb and we're doing watts that I know are completely unsustainable, um, I'll, I'll let them go. I don't mind letting them go and trying to trying to play catch up for the race. If if we get to the top of that climb and I'm still with the front group, even better. Yeah, I mean you can follow a good group too. I mean that's the one thing is at this particular race. I don't know. I think there's like a lead group like hmm. there's the front group which are like the high power riders the acclimated riders but then right behind them there's usually a little split there's like a hmm. group of 10 like really strong but very smart riders that know it's going to be stupid to go red line sure. and then they always catch on the descent the paved descent um and yeah that that next climb is actually a really good one for you it's like a gradual climb the one up sugar loof it's like four yeah. percent six miles long. Not that I've studied it or anything. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a yeah. really, really, uh, yeah. Solid way to get back on without really like going, going too hard. It's like the first climb people are, are like itchy, you know? Right. Um, but then after that, it seems to almost get a little easier. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think that there's, there's more roadies doing the race this year than there ever have been. Uh, yeah, with the definitely. lifetime great with the lifetime grand prix i i'm kind of hoping that some of them will have atrocious handling skills doing going down power line and if i'm if i'm off the back of the front group uh we can reconvene at the bottom of power line and and hopefully they got some big watts to put out on that that road section right after usually there's there's a handful of really strong triathletes or or roadies that mm -hmm. yeah they can they can hammer. I've I've been on that lucky train once. Okay. And you just sit on the back, you know, give your courtesy mm -hmm. pull for ten seconds, and then the group is just like. So, should be fun. All right. Yeah, we're coming. We're coming up on an hour here, um, but I don't think we got to the bottom of the question. What bike are you riding at Leadville, or is it top secret? Oh, Can't say. Oh, I'm riding the the new Lux. So. Okay. Um, you know, it wasn't like any conscious choice, but uh, hardtails for me, I don't use them very much to be mm -hmm. to be honest. So when asked what bike I want, I was like, I want a new Lux, like because mm -hmm. it'll be really perfect for ninety percent, ninety ninety nine percent of the rides I do, and then for Leadville, it'll be good. You know what I mean? It's it's going to be mm -hmm. very nice on the bumpy stuff. I can sit instead of stand. Um, you know, it's yeah. maybe a pound heavier, pound and yeah. half, whatever. So Big I'm deal. I'm on a I'm on a hardtail, and it's it's the it's the Factor Lando hardtail. It's the first hardtail that I've had in five years. I haven't I haven't had a hardtail bike 
that I could race in five years. My last wow. sponsor, they were like, you know, what bikes do you want? I didn't even tell them I wanted a hardtail. I was like, I have yeah. no, no need for that. In fact, the last time that I raced a hardtail uh, was in 2017 when we both did Mohican. You beat me. I rode a hardtail and I was like, this was the worst decision ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but I'm back on a hardtail and I'll, I'll be honest, the first ride I did on it, I was like, I can't believe people ride these things, but I've been riding it for the past three weeks now and, uh, I've gotten more used to it. It's, I, I haven't, I haven't touched my full suspension. I've only been riding my hardtail, even on some of the more rugged Colorado trails that I've been exploring. I've been riding my hardtail. So I think I'll be used to it for race day. That's it. You know, a lot of it's what you're used to. And to be honest, like for me to switch to a hardtail right now would also throw me off a bit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think as much funny talk as we've spilled out in the last hour, Adam, I think you'll appreciate and the general viewer will appreciate race what you ride. And so if mm -hmm. you're used to yeah. racing on a machine, you're very used to it. General rule of thumb for, for anyone out there, any of my clients or any of the clients that Dylan has, I'm sure it's the same is don't try to reinvent yourself the day before the race, you know, right. ride the same gear, same equipment. And, and the nice thing is that if you're used to it, you're going to ride more comfortable, more fat, you're going to ride more comfortably faster and, you know, have less issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and even like some of my clients, like if they ever ask me like, or even just friends or whatever family, um, the more simple you can make things, the better. So like, if you got to pick a mountain bike and you, and you know, or if you're, if you're a mountain bike racer, I, I mean, just having one bike in a full suspension, I think is truly the way to go. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, like we're talking like Dylan, I'm running a hardtail this year, but my life was way easier last year when I didn't even own a hardtail. Like I just had one <laughs> mountain bike. If it was a mountain bike race, I, I used my full suspension mountain bike. Like I never had to think about it. Definitely. You know, so it, it, it I totally agree. Like, yeah. you know, I, and I'm in the same boat as Dylan. I'm, I've been spending a ton of time on the hardtail just to get used to it. But yeah, it, it does make it a lot harder and more challenging to to switch back and forth between the platforms because they just, I mean, they handle different, they feel different. Yep. Um, the back end even feels kind of weird. Like the first time yeah. I hopped on the hardtail and went to like bunny hop over a log. Yeah. Like I couldn't like the the yeah exactly. The timing is completely different. You don't have like the suspension to spring off of. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's I agree. It's like if you can, if you only have one bike, just get a full suspension mountain bike and. Have that be your do it all mountain bike. Mm -hmm. um, the hardtail complicates things for sure. Uh, so JB, so before we go, I, I have one one thing I want to bring up. So 2018, I raced the inaugural uh, Epic Rides Oz Trail Off Road. Yeah, uh, down in Bentonville, Arkansas, it was the first year that they had that event, and you were you were there. Um, it was the year of like the 10 million flats. If you remember that yep. everyone, I think everyone except like four or five guys in the pro men's field flatted. It was gnarly. Um, it, it was super gnarly. Do you remember uh -huh. this was us? This was us finishing for, for the listeners out there. JB and I finished okay. across the line together. We rode the last like 10 or 15 miles together. There was like a group of us that all came together because we had flatted yeah, yeah. Eddie Anderson, Brian Lewis was there yeah, right. and we all just kind of like joy rode the last, 10 15 miles or whatever it was, it was just it was the most fun i've had like in in bentonville to be honest it was like you know when yeah racing was completely a non-factor it was like it was like a party out there hey it was you awesome yeah here too you know <laughs> somebody else with their flat they help you with their flat hey anybody got any plugs yeah i got some plugs here anybody got any food yeah i got some food uh it was actually pretty fun <laughs> To be honest. It was yeah, and, and the only smart one to bring a hand pump was JB. So there was like, there were probably five of us that were, were all in the group together just because we needed your hand pump. We'd yeah. run out of CO2s by that point that we just needed the hand pump every five minutes to pump up our tires. <laughs> yeah, that's uncommon but, uh, for me. It was super fun. Hand pump, but, you know, mm -hmm. I think with the NUE <laughs> races, I got used to riding with a hand pump because... yeah. Yeah, but that was that was super awesome. That was that was my first year racing at that like pro level. 
Um, so to get to cross the finish line with a legend like you is super cool. Thanks. I, in my dreams, I envisioned myself crossing the finish line with someone like you at the front of the race, not the back of the race. But either way, it was still it cool. It still counts. You know, anybody sees that picture, just say we were tired for first. <laughs> yeah, ain't nobody know. Yep. yep. That's right. It was awesome. <laughs> Cool. We'll look forward to seeing you guys out at Leadville. Um, going to do the Leadville warm up ride, which is, I think, on Thursday with the Leadville podcast. So um, that's usually a pretty good fun time to meet up with fans and stuff like that. They usually have like 100 people out there. Um, Sweet. And then, um, yeah, yeah, let, let gonna... the uh, let the listeners know where they can find you on the on the socials. Oh, yeah. So check me out on Strava, of course. And my Instagram handle is Jeremiah underscore Bishop underscore MTB underscore. So, yeah, Jeremiah underscore Bishop underscore MTB underscore. Anyway, I need Sweet. to find a more simple, a more <laughs> simple version of that. But anyhow, yeah. that's it. Also on Facebook. I have a YouTube channel called in the wheelhouse with Jeremiah Bishop. So, um, there I get to kind of vlog a little bit, share some stuff and, uh, yeah. You planning on doing a video for Leadville? I'm going to do something for that weekend. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, Danny's going to come out. who's a videographer. Uh, so we're going to get a bunch of footage. Um, we're going to try to get him on a moto or e-bike. Uh, mm -hmm. try to get some of the front group, hoping I'm in the front group. Maybe I'll be trying to get some of the third group. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Yeah. And da but. Danny's, Danny's hooked me up with some footage for, for some race reports as well. He does a good job. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. yeah especially now that they're not live streaming the event anymore. That was, you know, kind of a bummer news to hear. So it'd be cool to have some extra content out there. So they're not live streaming Leadville. Yeah, I guess Flow Bikes oh, is out for the uh, the Lifetime Grand Prix. Why? Any any dirt? I I, I don't know. Um, just, yeah, they, the news just I mean, I don't know if this is the, broke, the so. true dirt. Yeah, yeah, the news broke yesterday, but the the cycling news article said that it was just too challenging for them to set up the infrastructure that they needed to to like get the quality of videos that would serve the people. Yeah. Um. So I I think they went for like the you know, no media is better than bad media kind of look, mm -hmm. which, you know, I totally I mean, understand. Yeah, it wouldn't I thought... be the first time that they dropped the ball on, on coverage. So I, I guess they're maybe just kind of foreshadowing what might happen. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I guess I can it, understand it that way, but yeah, totally, totally yeah. understand that. I, I kind of had a discussion with their media team early on about it. Uh, well, I reached out to them. They were like, well, we got it covered. Mm -hmm. is a little bit more than how it went, to be honest. Um, it is not easy. It is not easy, but I've been to a lot of races that do a kick-ass job of it. Lead, Leadville has never really had a great live coverage. They have maybe okay updates, you know, intermittently mm -hmm. throughout the event. I would say Cape Epic 100% does the best job. Um, mm -hmm. And... You know, they have a big team. That is no joke. It's a big investment. But if there's one thing that holds true, invest in the media. Like, there's no doubt about it. It's a good payback. Yeah. So I hope that they find a, a good Yeah, tool. I mean, I, I feel bad for, for any of the Lifetime Grand Prix athletes like you guys. You know, you, you kind of signed up expecting that. Um, a lot of people have been following because they've had the live feeds. Yep. The live feed was really good at Sea Otter, and it was really good at Unbound. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there were there were some times where they, they dropped the ball a little bit, but yep. uh, Sea Otter was really good, actually, I thought. Uh, obviously, they didn't have Tusher for the same reasons. They, they I think they got out there and realized that it was going to be too challenging to get the connection or service or something. You know, the terrain yeah. was too difficult. I don't know what it was. What was your thought on uh, the live? But it is... It is did you do look at the live coverage from Unbound, Adam? Yeah, I was watching it. How was it? Yeah, it was okay. I mean, it, they tuned in late, so you kind of missed a lot of the early stuff in the race. But the good thing was uh, the Unbound Instagram feed had pretty good coverage early on. Yeah. So you kind of got to watch that and then tune in to the uh, Flow Bikes uh, coverage once that came on. And it was good. I mean, I was able to, like, you know, kind of keep it off to the side while I was doing some other stuff and, like, tune in and like, you know, 
Um, I think they, you know, the the announcing was maybe a little bit off. You, you definitely had to be watching because yep. they got names wrong and stuff like that. But that's okay. I mean, they're still new to it. Yeah. Um, but it was it was good overall. Like you got to at least see the action for the last hour and a half or so, two mm-hmm. hours of the race, uh, and it was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. There were some there were some things that were really good about it, and and also some things that were a big challenge. I thought. Um, it was awesome to watch Sea Otter because I was laid up. I wish I was there, but I got to see it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and because they had a different start time for the women, you could actually see the women's race. Um, the yes. coverage yep. was probably, you know, comparable between the two. And the women's race actually ended up in a dynamic that was more interesting. Uh, but in the case of a start at the same time, I know what they're trying to do, but they're also sabotaging not only – the fairness of the women's race, but the ability to cover the women's race effectively and as prominently as the men's race. Um, mm-hmm. yep. I'm a big proponent of doing what Cape Epic did. Sometimes you got to learn from other people's mistakes instead of make the mistake. Cape Epic for several years tried to run them concurrently and it was just a mess. You know, some of the bigger female riders that were really scrappy, like Annika Langevad, like she could fight in the front group with the men and just, you know, get an elbow in and she could like ride the front group and then phew, she's gone. Like the mm. other women are just like, you know, looking so, at this giant headwind. So Sophia uh, Gomez Villafana talked about this after Unbound and her, her perspective on Unbound was that she felt like she wasn't racing on other women. She felt like she was racing men the whole time because she was with men the whole time. Um, you know, from, from after the first hour of the race, she didn't see another woman for the entire race. And she thought it would have been a lot more interesting. Um, if, uh, if they'd had, you know, a separate, you know, they could, they could potentially do, this is this is a thought I've had, and we've talked about this on this podcast. Is maybe do something like uh, Epic Rides did, where you know maybe the Unbound Amateur Race is on Saturday, and the Unbound Pro Race is on Sunday, and the men start, and then the women start. So they're you know it's it's easier to cover, and yeah. the pros get their own start, and and also it just makes it better for the the pros in general because it's not as hectic a start. Um, yeah. with with a, a smaller field. I, I, I like it. You know, there's a lot of positive to that because gravel is not a grassroots event uh, type mm-hmm. anymore. <laughs> it is definitely a pro and pro-am style event. Mm-hmm. And it still can be cool. It still can be really fun. I think having different rules for events, not to get off on this is another podcast we're starting. <laughs> well, it's okay. We, we, you know, we can go off on tangents here. We don't have to cut the podcast while we're, we are we do not have so, to cut the podcast while we're talking about something interesting. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think that, you know, you look at the um, evolution for Cape Epic, good example. Mm. You know, when the field was like 300 people, no big deal. When it was 400, 500, 600, 800,000 people, 1200 people. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now it's starting to change. And I think having the integrity of a fair, easy to cover race, um, again, it's going to come up to the women. The women will ultimately have to voice their opinions and mm-hmm. be the voice of, of what they want to see happen. Um, but I'm just reflecting on my own personal observations of how much the racing improved and the coverage improved for Cape Epic once they sure. did that. It seemed to be a real... Um, a real positive uh, turning point for, for both. Um, the other thing is if you draft off of a male competitor, you get a warning. The second mm-hmm. time you get a five minute deduction. The third time you're out of the race. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there was, you know, there's no ways about it. Like, um, yeah, they, they definitely got pretty tight about the regulations. And once, they were adopted and, and everybody was on board with them. It was totally cool. And yeah, yeah, you see these small groups, the women, you know, um, I, I've seen it in person, you know, cause I flatted at Cape Epic and I'm, I'm back there, get back on. And the women, like you see, there's a train of women, like three or four of them. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. You know, they're like working together. There's a group right behind them. And it's like, you know, they have their own race again. Sure. 
Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I remember reading, I don't know if it was a Velo News article, Cycling News, but uh, they back last year when there was the big controversy about having male domestiques, if you're a, a female gla- uh, gravel racer, um, they were asking, they were asking all the top women, you know, what do you think a solution to this is? And do you think that we should do away with the one mass start and have a separate start? And, and to be honest, it was pretty mixed opinions amongst uh, top pro women. Some of them wanted a separate start. Some of them absolutely didn't want a separate start. So um, it's not, you know, it's not like there's, uh, there's one answer here. Yeah, yeah. Again, it's it's going to come up to um, yeah. The the women will have to decide, and... Mm-hmm. and 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 the other thing too is there's not there's not a one governing body for gravel, right? So all these races have different rules, right? And <laughs> so I love Pete, but Pete's rant was bullshit about the arrow bars, and you know. Oh boy, yeah, we talked about this too. <laughs> I'm sure Pete's gonna. You know, He's gonna love it when someone forwards his podcast to him. But I'll tell him to it. Just we, like, we already we've already talked about this, man. So yep. don't worry about you've it. You've already been around the block. Okay, yeah. And I honestly <laughs> yeah. think you know there needs to be a forum. Hey, mm-hmm. maybe there doesn't need to be a governing body for gravel. Mm-hmm. But like, hey, could there just be a Congress of gravel riders that votes on ideas? Mm-hmm. I'd say why not. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. you know the the amateurs and the pros, they have slightly different needs. Mm-hmm. Do you know any of the amateur riders that are going to run a 38 front chain ring for Leadville? Definitely not. Yeah, probably not. They shouldn't be. <laughs> they definitely shouldn't. Be. Unless they got a double. But yeah. if you ask, you know, Albin was running a 36. I was running, I was running a 36. Albin's running a 38. Wow. Like, yeah. monster gear. Yeah. Um, and so our needs are different. Yeah. Can we handle aero bars? Yes, most of the time. There'll be an occasional crash, but that's part of what we sign up for. And then the amateurs, there are a lot of people who probably should not be riding air bars and sand and gravel. Mm-hmm. Facts. Um, but then as we, we look at the events, we look at gravel, the spirit of gravel, uh, spirit of bike racing. I mean, man, we just got done filming Tour de France gravel, which for me was really profound in that I got to see the evolution of these draconian rules in road racing. Mm-hmm. And at first it was very loose. It was like two gears, zero outside assistance. It was like unbound, you know, yeah. don't cheat. Yep. If you cheat, that, that was about the, the gist of the rules. Right. But the there was UCI, still plenty of cheating back then, but. There was, but I mean, <laughs> the, the rules were very, mm-hmm. they were very loose. You know, it was, it was open to interpretation and it became more and more strict and more and more governed. And now you have rules on the sites then a height of your socks, whether or not you wear sleeves, uh, geometry, tube shape. They have a jig to make sure your bike is compliant. Um, you know, it's, it definitely takes the fun out of it at, at some mm-hmm. point uh, when it's overly um, restrictive. And I think one of the things that, at least at this point, has not been spoiled, but the UCI is, is coming for it. They're definitely trying to make this gravel series. They have a gravel world championships in Northern Italy this year um, is that we have different governing bodies and we have different rule sets. One allows mm-hmm. error bars. One doesn't allow error bars. Hell, I want to see one that's like, you know, the 1926 Tour de France. And while you're in the aid station, the clock stops for five minutes. So you can keep on going and, you know, keep on racing, whatever. Uh, Having different rules and different styles, I think is awesome. Brian Duro, mm-hmm. freaking awesome. Um, you know, I think I'd like to see some of these bike packing races have like a daylight or, or a, what do you call it? Daylight rule where you, you know, can only move during sunrise to sunset. Or if you, yeah, ride you in, can't ride at night. Yeah. Or if you ride in the dark, it's to get to the end of the day segment, you know, to the race village. Sure. Or something mm-hmm. like that. Because that was super fun, what we did. It's five o'clock for our um, for France gravel. Um, it was it was really neat and kind of opened my eyes to how very contained in a box all of the rules are now and the formats. Quite frankly, mm-hmm. they're they're kind of yeah. getting more and more mm-hmm. uh, homogenized, I guess. Um, 
And I think it'd be just really sick. I mean, how cool would it be if there was like, you know, a gravel race where the entire thing wasn't timed. It was like only the second half of it was timed or maybe there was time bonuses for, you know, the time sections. Mm -hmm. You know, if you won the time section, you get a 10 second time bonus. I don't know. Be kind of cool. Yeah. Well, there, there are definitely some, yeah, some I, I'd love to see more stage racing. Format. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, similar to like a grand Fondo type thing, I guess. Mm hmm that's you know, kind of similar formats there, but yeah, I'd love to see more stage racing come to gravel, like the Oregon trail stage race that, that, uh, you know, came out a few years ago. Um, to be honest, like when I, when I first kind of heard about it, the whole idea of like sleeping in a tent for five days and then riding a hundred plus miles on gravel every day, I was like, that just seems like really hard. <laughs> but then like you look and it's, it looks, so, it looks so much fun though. Like, like yeah. everyone just has a blast doing that. I um, mean, and you can come up with so many different cool, like races within the race when you've got multi-day races going on. Oh yeah. You can have, um, a and yeah, I think, I think that'd be fun to, I mean, like how cool would that be if yeah. you had like an enduro jersey and then you have a climber's jersey, yep. like you could just focus on one, put your 2.0 tires on, be like, you know, I'm going to focus on this. Yeah, totally. All right. Well. I think we started recording the second podcast here. Yeah, no, that's okay. We'll have to get you on for a second one, and no, we'll talk about the spirit of gravel for the whole time. Yeah, I'll wear a ghost outfit. <laughs> yeah, this was super fun, though, JB. I appreciate you coming on and taking some time out of your day, and look forward to seeing up at 10,000 feet. All right. I'll bring my oxygen tank. <laughs> cool. See you out there. All right. See you guys. Thanks for having me.